Muito bem. Então, é, podemos iniciar? É, então, é, eu queria dar bem-vindas a, a todos que estão nos assistindo aqui pelo Zoom e pelo YouTube. É, esse evento, que é um evento que foi possível graças a uma interação entre a, a Programa de Pós-Graduação do Instituto de Física, também a Pró-Reitoria de Pesquisa. Esse é, ao mesmo tempo, um colóquio Gleb Vatagen e uma USP Lecture. É, e, e a gente tem o privilégio de ter a professora Michal Lipson, da Columbia University. Deixa eu, um, quem vai introduzir a, a Michal é o, o professor Paulo Nussensweig, um, mas deixa eu só dizer que é, o colóquio Gleb Vatagen é um colóquio, uh, que é um evento que vai além desse, de, dessa apresentação que a Mihal vai fazer aqui, ela também esteve numa conversa com nossos estudantes, que foi excelente durante a parte da manhã, e que a segunda parte agora é esse colóquio que é aberto para todo mundo e que realmente vai ser um, um grande privilégio a gente escutar a Mihal falar sobre um assunto da mais absoluta, total, absolutamente fascinante, mas para introduzir a Mihal e... e e, e dar uma ideia da, do perfil da, da grande pesquisadora que ela é, eu vou pedir para o Paulo, então, o Paulo Nussensweig, nos falar mais sobre ela. Então, Paulo, por favor. Então, obrigado, Raul. E, é, antes de mais nada, obrigado, Michal. Obrigado a, a todos aqueles que estão assistindo. O privilégio que a gente tem de ter a professora Michal Lipson falar conosco hoje. Como o professor Raul Abramo já mencionou, o Coloque o Gleb Batagin é uma iniciativa que a gente procura fazer uma vez por ano, como um evento no Instituto, um evento dedicado principalmente aos nossos alunos de pós-graduação, para trazer uma pessoa importante para falar com os alunos, falar um pouco sobre a carreira, estimular os alunos a terem grandes ambições. Nos três primeiros anos, nós tivemos três homens, e nós queríamos trazer uma cientista de alto prestígio e a conversa hoje de manhã mostrou o quanto valeu a pena trazer alguém como a Michal. Eu tenho uma, uma, sempre uma tarefa um pouco difícil apresentar alguém que é muito mais conhecida do que eu. É, a professora Michal Lipson é, se... Começou os estudos de física dela no Instituto de Física da USP. Ela fez dois anos do curso de graduação. Em seguida, ela foi para Israel, onde ela terminou a graduação dela. Ela fez o doutorado no Technion, em Israel. E, depois disso, foi para os Estados Unidos, uma, um pós-doutorado no MIT, e, e assumiu uma posição na Universidade de Cornell, onde ela foi pioneira na criação dessa área de nanofotônica de silício. Ela, por ter essa ligação com o Brasil, ela esteve no Instituto algumas vezes, e eu tive a felicidade de conhecê-la quando ela veio apresentar um colóquio. Nós, relativamente rápido, ficamos muito amigos, e a Michala é uma das, talvez, não sei se é a única pessoa, mas uma das poucas pessoas que é minha amiga pessoal próxima, que tem certificado de gênio. Ela ganhou, em 2010, o MacArthur Fellowship, que é conhecido como Genius Award, o Genius Grant. Então, é uma das poucas pessoas que eu posso apresentar dessa forma. Eu tive um privilégio enorme de passar um ano trabalhando como professor visitante em Cornell e colaborando diretamente com ela, e a gente vem colaborando desde então. E eu disse para muitas pessoas que a gente conhece né, amigos, faz amizades fora do ambiente da pessoa, e a gente não conhece a pessoa perfeitamente enquanto a gente não vê a pessoa no próprio ambiente de trabalho. Eu vi, eu vivi um ano interagindo com o grupo dela, com os estudantes dela, os pós-docs, os colaboradores, e a minha admiração por ela só cresceu. É, a Michal tem vários... Várias, vários atributos, vocês podem ler numa página da Wikipedia sobre ela, o que eu pude verificar de informação parece estar tudo correto, eu não quero então me estender demais, eu quero só dar a ideia da importância dessa grande figura é, que 
ainda por cima é, é uma pessoa extremamente acessível e uma palestrante muito, muito dotada, eu quero chamar a atenção que o ano passado ela foi a recipiente do Comstock Award, Comstock Prize in Physics, da National Academy of Sciences, que é um prêmio que é dado com intervalos relativamente grandes, mas só para dar uma ideia para vocês da liga da qual ela faz parte, o primeiro ganhador desse prêmio foi Robert Millikan, depois dele, Clinton Davison, Percy Bridgman, Ernest Lawrence, William Shockley, Charles Towns, Leon Cooper, Robert Schrieffer, Robert Dickey e por aí vai. É John Bacall tem vários nomes, vários desses né, ganhadores do Prêmio Nobel de Física. Então, é realmente um enorme privilégio e um grande prazer pessoal apresentar para vocês a professora Michal Lipson. Ok, Paulo, agora vai ser um pouquinho difícil falar. <risos> é um prazer enorme estar uh, tá, uh, tá falando com... Uh, aqui com vocês, eu estou vendo aqui nomes uh, de muitos amigos e ex-alunos queridos uh, da Inês. E, uh, 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 Paulo, uh, eu podia falar de você coisas, as mesmas coisas que você falou uh, de mim. Uh, just so that you know, when Paulo comes to the group, he visits us once a year, We all get, the, the students get very excited. They prepare and prepare stuff to talk to him. It's a big event. So uh, uh, what we gave you, you gave us. Um, so I'm going to talk uh, in English, but uh, eu falo português, eu, eu entendo perfeitamente. Meu português está um pouquinho enferrujado. Então, não, eu acho que eu não consigo falar... Uh, de física em português, mas uh, uh, vocês, especialmente os alunos, podem me perguntar sem problema em português. So, the way we do optics today, either it's microscopy, sensing, whatever it is, it's completely different than the way we did, say, 20 years ago. Today, all cutting edge optics or photonics is not done on tabletops anymore. There are no fibers. That's not the future. The future is all integrated, printed, just like we do with electronics. They're all printed like you see on a wafer. So the same way that uh, uh, electronic used to be with wires and transistors, and now it's all printed circuits, the same way optics is now transitioning from fibers and lenses to actual, all integrated, printed in massive. And that enables scalability. So it enables us to start dreaming on how to manipulate light in ways that we could not done, uh, could not do before. So uh, the field of uh, silicon photonics is one of the fastest moving fields. It, it started with the vision, this is a very old picture, but it, it really illustrates uh, the goal of the field. Uh, it started with the goal of being introduced on computing. The goal was really just make computers faster. Today is way beyond that. But the original goal was to make computers faster and uh, uh, to ensure that computers don't dissipate uh, uh, power the way they, they do using electrical wires. So today, most computers are limited by the heat that they dissipate. And that heat, that power, has nothing to do with computing. 
it has everything to do with just data transmission. It's not about the speed of computing. That doesn't really burn much power. What burns most of the power is just taking the data out of processor, moving it to another processor, taking data out of a processor, moving it to a memory. That burns power. But if you do it with optical wires, optical waveguides, as opposed to electrical waveguides, it doesn't burn as much power at all. And we know that if we touch an electrical wire, it's hot. If we touch an optical wire, a waveguide, it's not. So that's, that's the vision. That's why Silicon Photronics was born in the first place, was to make computers faster. But today, it's way beyond that. And I'm going to show you down, down the line in the presentation, uh, lots of examples of applications where you want to have massive amount of, uh, of optics printed on a chip. What can you do with that? But before that, let me give you a little bit of the history. So when the field was born uh, in around the year 2000, it became clear that this is what we want to do. We want to replace electrical wires with optical wires. But the industry, the microelectronic industry, the ones actually doing those, those computers, they uh, uh, were very happy about, uh, about this prospect of introducing light, but there was one condition. You can introduce light, but everything that you use, the way you guide light, the way you switch light, the way you, you imprint your information, the ones and zeros into light, all of this, all of those components have to be compatible with microelectronics. So what does it mean compatible? Meaning it has to be the same material, that's to start. And the material for microelectronics is silicon. But remember that in the year 2000, silicon was only microelectronic, was not optical. And that means many, many, many challenges. So I'm gonna show you a few examples of uh, challenges that we have to overcome to make that happen. Um, and it all boils down to kind of fundamental challenge and that's why I like, I like this field because you have to ask yourself, okay, why is this a problem? What is the challenge? And then what is the physics that we need to put in to actually overcome that? Okay, the absolute first one, the most difficult one that we all had to deal with is how the hell do we send light from a fiber that is 10 microns in size to a tiny little waveguide wire well, actually light is propagating, that the size of the waveguide is uh, tiny. I don't know, mm, 200 nanometer. We're talking about like 2000 atoms, okay? We're talking about a completely different orders of magnitude. And that size of the waveguide is fundamental. I cannot make it larger. And I'll talk about that uh, a little later, but that is fundamental. That is the size of the waveguide. So just to give you an idea, when I was doing uh, my postdoc at MIT, the way we sent light into those tiny little waveguide was by taking the, the, the waveguide, putting a huge fiber through a little uh, a lens, the best lens that we could get, and adjusting, the, adjust, the adjustment was ours. There was a lot of rain. And in the end, fundamentally, I actually asked my students to calculate what is fundamentally the, uh, the coupling, even if you use a lens, 2% you got out. So obviously that's not sustainable. Okay, so that's, that's kind of the problem. Uh, you send light and then uh, you wanna get light into the fiber and other way around, you wanna get light from the fiber into the waveguide. And just a reminder, uh, I know you all know that, but sometimes I get those questions. Everything is reciprocal. So when I send light from the waveguide, 
the, uh, my problem of sending light from the fiber to the waveguide, even though it seems harder, but it is the same as sending light from the waveguide to the fiber. Okay, so in order to overcome this problem, we, uh, uh, we came up with the following, this was around 2003, back at Cornell uh, in my group, it was a fantastic uh, uh, Brazilian student. All my Brazilian students are amazing. Uh, and, but uh, this one was my first student, Wilson Almeida, and he came up with a solution for that. Uh, and the solution was to take the waveguide and instead of making it larger up to the size of the fiber, we said, no, 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 make it smaller. Make it down to a tip. It seems kind of counterintuitive. And if you do that, then I promise you that if you point it more or less towards the center of the fiber, if you just make a tip like a pencil on your waveguide, all the light is gonna be sucked in into the waveguide. So how does it work? So we are relying here on a principle of waveguides uh, that says that if the waveguide is completely symmetric, meaning that the material on the top and the material on the bottom, they are all identical. Then the waveguide has no cutoff, meaning no matter how small you make your little tip here, even if it's much smaller than the wavelengths, much smaller than the wavelengths, it will still be guided. It can be guided by a wire. There is no cutoff. The shape of, of the mode of, of, when I say mode, I mean shape of, of light, of the field propagating, uh, will be a little weird. It, will, it won't be inside. It can't really fit inside. It will be all over the place, but it will still be guided in this direction. So what we're really doing is taking light that is kind of completely confined and delocalizing it, forcing it out, but still will always guide. And you don't have to be afraid, it won't leak. So this is the evanescent field, the evanescent field we are looking into this direction, so the energy is propagating, right? And what's nice here is that what light actually feels is the index or the material outside the waveguide, not inside, because it's not really inside. Most of the light is outside. So a fiber is made out of glass, right? So my goal is to get light that is propagating in the fiber in glass and make it feel like it's propagating, continue to propagate in glass. So I need to put here a material that has the same properties of glass, optical properties. Oxide, oxide is glass really. So just silicon oxide, it's just amorphous glass. I can deposit this. So we put here oxide here, oxide here, and then because all the light is outside anyway, it feels like it's continuing to propagate in the fiber. So this is, this is the oxide. Okay, so that was challenge number one. And today, uh, this taper, it's called inverse taper. That's this coupling. It is the major way of coupling in plane. That's how, what everybody uses today. Uh, uh, this tapering in and making it even smaller. Now the challenge number two, and they were all around the same year, this one, 2005, 2004 was, okay, now that I know how to get light into the waveguide, I need to be able to imprint my information. So I told you that the goal was, let's say, to propagate from processor to processor. Well, if I propagate 
from parcel to processor, the data of the processor to memory, the data that is coming out of the processor comes in ones and zeros. And it's around one volt. And it's gigahertz. So one zero, one zero, one zero with, with the rate of about uh, sub nanosecond. So I need to take that information and transfer it to light. So I want light propagating the wave rad. I want it to look one black, white, black, white. I want it yes light, no light. So basically what I need is something that when I apply one volt, I have a chopper that chops my light with that rate. I must say that as a young scientist, when I started this, this was a perfect problem to have. Uh, especially if I might say, might say a woman scientist was perfect because it was super objective. The numbers here were perfect. Yeah, I had just to reach the numbers. There is no uh, subjectivity here. So we needed gigahertz, uh, uh, something that translates electrical to change in optical properties, right? I want a, I want a material that becomes opaque uh, from, from transparent to opaque at a very fast rate with only one volt applied. So the requirements were, were very, very strict. Okay, so what's the challenge? The challenge is a silicon doesn't really have an electro-optic coefficient, meaning the optical properties don't change with applied voltage. There are many materials that they do change. For example, if you buy a, uh, uh, a modulator out of Thorlab, it is, it is this, basically, you apply a voltage and it changes its, uh, it, it, uh, it changes its optical properties. But it is based on an electro-optic coefficient. For example, lithium niobate has a strong electro-optic coefficient. It's a, it's a material property. For those of you that work with uh, photonics, it's the equivalent of chi 2 But silicon doesn't. And it's fundamental. It has to do with the symmetry of the crystal. You apply voltage, nothing happens. The effective index, everything stays the same. So we had to come up with a way of doing that. And the way uh, we did that is we used a very, very small effect that it does exist in silicon, which it's the fact that you can, if you inject a little bit of carriers, like electrons and holes, you're gonna change a little bit the optical properties of the material or, or the index of refraction, okay, or the velocity of light. Now, but the effect is so small that it's, uh, we knew about it, but it wasn't useful. And we made it useful by creating this structure that's called the ring resonator that is used now in, in many, 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 many different applications. But this was one of the first time that a ring resonator was used as a modulator, basically, uh, we created this, this is a cavity. So this is a waveguide you're looking from the top. Let's just look at the black lines. You are set, you're looking on the top. This is a little chip, right? And you're sending light from the bottom. And light goes here and then it kind of couples. It takes a few, uh, uh, it takes a, uh, yeah, a fraction of uh, um, uh, a femtosecond to actually couple, but it, it couples, takes a little bit of time, and it couples here to that uh, waveguide, and it circulates in this, in this waveguide. This waveguide is identical to this waveguide, but it's just wrapped around. So if, you, if you're doing some experiments in the lab, if you are part of Paolo and Marcelo's lab, uh, you know that you have a, you know what, I'm, I'm sure you know what a cavity is, right? You have many of those in your lab. This is identical, only it's in plane. And the, uh, so basically what we did here is, is did the following, took that cavity and said, okay, which wavelengths, at which color of light that I'm sending, light actually sees that cavity. 
only very specific ones, only the ones that fit there exactly an integer number of times. Right? It's a constructive interference condition. At all other wavelengths, light will just ignore the ring and just go straight, okay? So I'm gonna pick one of those wavelengths. I'm gonna pick a wavelength that fits here exactly an integer number of times. And then I'm gonna take that circumference and change it so that light doesn't fit there anymore and go straight. So basically what I'm doing, I am, I am going from constructive interference condition where light builds up in the cavity to destructive where it, light doesn't see the, the cavity. And I need, depending on the quality factor of the cavity, meaning how many times I can uh, stay in that cavity, I need very little optical change, very need to path change to make light hop between the cavity and the waveguide. So, uh, uh, so that's, that's how we did that. And we changed the optical properties just by injecting a little bit of, uh, uh, of holes and uh, 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 of electrons and uh, holes. That changes a little bit the effective path. And today there are many, many modulators based on that principle. All modulators use some kind of enhancement and use the fact that the, uh, that the carriers change the optical properties. And today there are, what's incredible is that today modulators, this is an example of a recent, there are still many papers on modulators. Uh, the performance, like the speed of those modulators is incredible is way, way better than modulators done out of lithium niobate. Which, remember that in the beginning of the field, it seemed impossible that silicon would be an optical material. And now, uh, silicon is outperforming all other uh, uh, platform. And it has to do with the fact that we make our devices on silicon that leverages a billion dollar infrastructure of microelectronics. So the processing is perfect. The way we make the waveguides, the, the shaping, everything is, is uh, I'm gonna show you some example, is very, very high, very, very good. So one example uh, is how well we can define the waveguide. So now you're looking at the cross section. And this is more recent work done in, uh, uh, in my group uh, by a student named William. And so we are sending light into, into my plane, into, into the uh, screen. Now, if these boundaries are not perfect, then every little perturbation will scatter light and will lead to losses. So most of losses in silicon photonic waveguides are all scattering, are not really losses, absorption, are not intrinsic, they're mostly... So how well can we define or how well we need to define? Well, until recently, until 2017, no matter where you made your waveguides, all the, you would lose 50% of the light after one centimeter. One centimeter is not so bad, by the way, because remember our wavelength is about, I don't know, one micron, depending on the color that you're using. So one centimeter is many, many wavelengths, but it's still, it's, it's, it's small. Uh, it's a lot to lose 50% and for any large system is, is problematic. So we, we said, okay, we're gonna address this problem. Where is, where is it coming from? And there were many theories at the time. We said, oh, maybe people said that maybe it could be some absorption sites, maybe some molecules at the boundary that maybe they, they absorb some of the light. We said, you know what, let's reduce the scattering points down to the absolute minimum we can. 
And let's keep seeing if we are improving our losses. Are we getting better and better and better? And the losses were very quickly became so low that we always have to measure them in, in resonators. And I will talk more about that because we had the losses were so low, it was impossible to measure them if you just send your light into the wave that we had to amplify. It. The bottom line, and I will talk a little bit more about this later, is that we now can, and that's because we are doing it in, in a silicon platform, we now can make those interfaces subatomic, meaning this can be less than 0.1 nanometer on average. A fluctuation, but on average, as a 0.1 nanometer. Which means that the losses are, the actual optical losses, because, because the interface is so perfect, is extremely low. So we can guide a meter on a chip with no problem. So we have, uh, if you wanna read the recipe on exactly how to make those low loss waveguides, you can read uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this paper, the beauty here, and for those of you that uh, you might say, oh, maybe she has this amazing fabrication facility and I don't have that. It's not, it's, it's what we are using is a very standard process in uh, silicon photonics. It's mostly uh, polishing, and etching, these are things that can be uh, implemented in any fab. Okay, so the, uh, this is a slide that basically shows the booming of that field. It started, like I said, early 2000, and very quickly in less than a decade, it went for, to, from kind of basic ideas to actual products being uh, uh, in the market. And Today, the, the applications of photonics are way beyond data communications. So I told you kind of the history where it all started uh, and it was great to have a very good application because that's kind of ensured that the industry was behind it. But today, the applications are all over the place. So what I'm showing here is everything in orange are other applications that are not data communication. You can see that they are growing very fast. And, all are, and, and the green are the data centers. We know that there are now silicon photonics in all data centers, but they are being introduced for, uh, uh, for fast and low power computing, but other applications are growing. So I'm gonna give you an example of other applications that is very hot. Uh, and then I'm gonna go back to uh, what are the challenge for that. So, okay, so this, this slide basically just show all the applications and uh, these sensing applications, medical applications, uh, uh, there is spectroscopy, and I'm gonna focus on LIDAR. I'm gonna to explain to you uh, what it is. And for full disclosure, I have a startup on LIDAR, so I should say it's named Voyant. Uh, and it's based on the project that we started that I'm gonna describe to you. Um, okay, so what is LIDAR? So for autonomous vehicles, if you wanna, self-driving cars, right? Kind of, that is kind of the holy grail, all uh, at least before uh, COVID, this was the hardest thing in California. So what you want is high resolution, right? You want the resolution of light. You don't want uh, radar, uh, uh, you, want, uh, you don't want radio wave resolution, you want resolution of light. So, and you want light to be able to tell you how fast the car is driving, and where is it in 3D? So the way it's done is it's done using a LIDAR. LIDAR comes from radar, which is kind of the same thing that people do for uh, radar for, uh, um, uh, for planes uh, using radio waves where they kind of, or submarines, right? Where you see in the movies where they have a, a movable 
beam of radio, right? That, uh, that comes back and then you based on the acoustic that comes back to you, you can tell where, you, where the submarine is. The same thing, but now we're gonna do it with light, the LIDAR. So uh, what I'm showing here is an example of a car uh, uh, that has this LIDAR and it has this thing in, the, uh, in its head, uh, which is it's a movable optical beam. It's a laser on a mechanical stage. And it's basically an interference system. So you are sending light and you are receiving the few photons that come back. Imagine, right? From wherever it is, come a few photons, you are interfering them with the light that you sent that has some signature or something that in time that can tell you when it was sent. And based on that interference, you, you can extract where do you stand, how fast you are moving, and where in space relative to, to the object that got reflected. Now, if any of you have done any interference experiment, you would know that this is crazy. Because, I mean, when I build an interferometer on my uh, table top, I just need to fool on it. And the whole fringes, the fringe move, the, my actual uh, data moves. It's not stable. Interference requires nanometer, right, or sub, sub wavelengths, right, or nanometer uh, uh, precision. 10 to the minus nine meter precision. So all of this interference needs to happen on this little thing sitting on the car while the car is driving. So, and, and while the mechanical thing is moving. So that's kind of, a, it's a, this is a engineering feat, is a, is a miraculous engineering. And now you understand why this thing costs at least as much as the car. But you can do that with silicon photonics. And the beauty is that everything is on a chip. It's all the system. There are no movable part. So you don't have, so the whole stability, which we're worried about goes away. And you can print thousands of those simultaneously. So let me tell you how, how can you do that scanning with silicon photonics. So the principle is the following. You, uh, you take a beam of light and you split it into many antennas. These antennas are just the waveguides. But remember that our waveguides are 200 nanometers, very, very small. My wavelengths in space is 1500 nanometers, much larger. So when light actually gets out of each one of those waveguides, it acts as a dipole. So if all the waveguides are close together and they're all in phase, coherent, they will form a nice beam. So it's, it's a kind of a bonus that we have with silicon. It might not work well with other systems. You do need very high confinement so that light actually uh, uh, really behaves like a dipole so that it can interact with the neighbor, with, a, with, a, with the adjacent uh, dipole, with the adjacent waveguide. Okay, now, up till now, everything that I told you is how to form a beam, right? And they're, and they're all coherent. Now, if I take the phase of some of them and delay them relative to the others, I can tune my beam. So basically I'm telling this, uh, light to emit slightly uh, later than this. Now, uh, 
Oh, by the way, I should I should motivate you. Just this is a side, a little parenthesis. Uh, we are just working on the analogy of these with uh, arrays of atoms because all those uh, uh, phased array can be emulated by any dipole. Uh, so if you're interested, there are lots of analogies in many, many fields of physics uh, of coherent arrays or coherent ensembles uh, that uh, form, uh, that, that can interact via light. Just a, a little parenthesis. Okay, so now how do you actually tune this? How do you, how do you actually tell it to delay? You change the optical properties of this waveguide. So you kind of, you, uh, just like I told you with the modulator, you change the optical properties. Uh, so you delay one relative to another. Now for large beams and for tunable, you need many, 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 many waveguides and you need to be able to control all of them. And we show that, we show that this can be done. Uh, and we actually, uh, we actually implemented it, but there was a secret. If you actually try to make, let's say, thousands of those, we did 500, okay? If you just try to make 500 waveguides, just the way I told you, it will, naively, it will not work. Because the power that it takes to actually change the phase of one waveguide is so high that it induces kind of uh, thermal uh, effect, like heat, that will change the phase of the neighbor. And basically, I, they end up what we call crosstalk. They end up talking. These waveguides are supposed to be independent, but they end up talking via heat. And that's kind of fundamental because in photonics, in general, not just for silicon photonics, for any photonics, any optical, all modulators are very, very uh, inefficient. We can only change the optical properties by 0.1%. This is true for anything, for lithium niobate, for any modulator. Only, we can only change the speed of light or the index of attraction by 0.1%. Maybe the maximum could be 1%, that's it, fundamental. And that's why you need a lot of power to actually get enough. Like here we need a full pi phase shift in order to, to actually uh, switch, uh, move the beam. So we try to address this problem. We said, okay, if this is a general problem, I like this kind of problem, it's fundamental. How do we increase the efficiency, meaning decrease the power of any modulator. It doesn't matter what material it is. So really, if you look, if you take a step back, well, I could put it in a resonator, right? I could put it in a resonator and get uh, uh, going back and forth. And then any change that I make here will be kind of amplified by the time light stays in the resonator, right? Wrong. Because when I put it in a resonator, I, uh, uh, I pay a, a strong price in bandwidth, meaning it only works for one wavelength. And at the bottom line, if you actually do the math, it doesn't really make sense. Uh, it's, 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 it becomes too, for this to be actually effective, the bandwidth is too small. So wait, so we ask then, okay, so we step back and we said, is there any way to recycle light in a, but without, forming a cavity. Because when you think about it, so why would a cavity, why a cavity forms when you actually recycle light? It forms due to interference, basically. Every time light actually re is reflected here, it interferes with the one that went in, right? 
And that, that is a cavity. And that's what limits the bandwidth. I don't want that. I want to recycle light. I want really this to be equivalent to one folded waveguide. I don't want any interference. So in order for me to avoid interference, and this is kind of a very general what I'm saying. So in order for me to avoid interference, I need to make sure that when light is actually coming back, it looks different than the one that went in. It's in what we call a orthogonal mode, orthogonal phase, right? It's, it, it has to be a different, uh, uh, it, uh, different properties than the one that went in so that they won't interfere. So what are orthogonal states in light, right? What, can you, what are the types of light that won't interact? You can do wavelengths, but here I'm sending one wavelength. I don't really wanna, uh, 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 I want it to be bandwidth independent. So wavelengths I can't use. I can use polarization, but I have only two polarizations. One, it's a rectangular wave that I can use either this or this, that's it. So I can maybe go twice, forward and backward. If I, if I, I can go forward, change the polarization, go backward, but that's it. If I send it back again, it will interfere with the first one that I went in, right? So, but there is another properties of light that is rarely used and is now becoming harder and harder because we are now learning how to work with it. And it's given to us for free in silicon photonics. And it's the spatial distribution of light inside the waveguide. So depending on my shape, I can guide light, the shape of my waveguide. I can guide light like relative to the wavelengths. I can guide light in this shape or in this shape or in this shape. They are all in very, very, uh, uh, they all could have the same, the same frequency of propagation. I send same wavelengths that I send in but I can choose to guide either here or here or here. Now, these are uh, called transverse spatial modes. And these kind of modes, the shape that light uh, uh, propagates, exist in fibers. And people know that. But they don't really use it. And it's very problematic to use it because for fibers, the, the velocity or the speed that light propagates in this mode and in this mode are almost the same. And in this one, in this one, almost the same. There's almost no way of, of they all kind of co-propagate together. And if they co-propagate together, every little disturbance will mix them together because they kind of see each other very much. They kind of, co-propagate together and every little disturbance in the system that break the orthogonality, which can happen very easily. For example, they, they are orthogonal if I go straight in a waveguide. If I bend my waveguide, they're not orthogonal anymore. So any little disturbance, change in temperature, tiny little bend, tiny little strain will make these waveguides start coupling together and they are not orthogonal and they will interfere. But in silicon, these modes are very separated, meaning that the velocity, the speed, the group velocity that light propagates in this mode can be easily three times higher than the one that this mode propagates. The difference in, in uh, group velocities can be very large in, and I can engineer it. They become less and less as I go to higher order modes, but still they are very separated. And I'm not gonna talk about this, but you can read uh, in this paper, we now know how to excite one mode 
specific mode and how to just that mode out of a waveguide and how to put in just that mode. And I will just tell you in general how we do it. We uh, uh, bring in, uh, if I have a large waveguide and let's say I just wanna excite this mode. I want light to propagate just in this shape. I, ex I send light with exactly parallel to that waveguide with exactly that group velocity. And it will, because the group velocities are so different, only this mode will be excited. Okay, so trust me, we know now how to excite only this mode, only specific mode, and how to peel only specific mode. Well, if I know how to do it, then there are many, many applications, but one application is making everything more efficient. Basically, I can take a waveguide and physically fold it by using the different modes. So, for example, I can send in light in this mode. Then I, uh, it's, it comes back, but before it comes back, I do my little magic, which is just making sure that the group velocity is just right. And I transform this to this. Now, when I do this, when I take this mode and I transition to this mode, and it's basically just by shaping the waveguide slowly, if I do it right, it will just by sh a careful shaping of the waveguide, I can move this waveguide, uh, I can transform this mode to this mode. When light propagates in this mode, it doesn't see the first one. They won't interfere. And then again, oh, I'm about to hit the wall and get back. But before that, I take it out, transform it to the next mode. Oh, and only then put it back in my modulator. And at the end, when I wanna get out, I can just transform to my first, my regular waveguide, and that's it. So nobody knows here what happens inside my little box. But my box is equivalent to taking a waveguide and, and, uh, and, uh, and wrapping it around, which is very, very hard. It's very hard to bend uh, waveguides. It's basically impossible to bend waveguides too strongly. A light likes to propagate in straight lines. By doing this, it's fine. So, uh, I'm, I'm not, this is one example on how you convert light from this to this. Uh, uh, you basically shape very, very carefully, and there is a lot of math involved on how to shape this spatial distribution of light or how light is propagating to here. And just remember that here light is propagating much slower than when it propagates in this mode. So you kind of slow light and transition here you can't tell, but if you if you read uh, the paper, uh, especially this paper that's about to come out, but uh, what we published last year in Clio gives already quite a lot of intuition. Uh, we are changing the waveguide width and the waveguide spacing so that this mode is converted to this mode. We've shown that we can just peel out only the 12th order mode. Let's say I have light propagating many, many more. Oh, I just peel out that mode or I can just put in that mode. Anyway, we now have full control and that is the way we take out one of the modes. So I take out one of the modes and convert it to the other mode. So it's just a physical structure. It's very small, it's about 10 microns. It's passive, doesn't consume any energy. It's really just converting it. And uh, so that's exactly how, how we do it. And so let's say this is, my modulator. This is the one that I actually want to change my face. Now, in this specific example. So I know how much energy it takes to change the phase of light. Now, I put in this, I do this trick. I put these extra structures here and extra structures here. They are all passive. But what these structures are responsible are for making light propagate back and forth into this 
little uh, modulator. This is where I'm applying my heat or my electrical power to change the phase. After I put in these structures, my power goes down by at least, and usually more, it has to do with the relative group velocity, at least the number of modes. So I just gave you a relatively simple way of lowering the power, making everything more efficient of any active device. It's basically taking the path of light and bending it using these orthogonal modes. Uh, and the bottom line for you to uh, get, uh, get a feeling of, so, so basically these modulators, just going back to the LiDAR, they enable our LiDAR. Otherwise it would be, the, uh, uh, would be impossible to actually get all those to, uh, uh, to emit and, and be, have independent phases. But now our power is so little that they don't really cross talk. So that magic was very important for us. And just to show you how it works, uh, we, I asked the students to, uh, to show how fast we can move the beam using the LiDAR. Uh, and if it's mechanical, you know that it's a little small, slower. And here, because it's just uh, uh, electrical control of the phase, it's uh, faster. And one of the students is a musician, so he, he put together this uh, this video. So let's see if it's uh, um, So uh, this was this was done to illustrate the real time. The real time. Now, uh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to, unfortunately, I'm going to have to skip skip uh, quite a lot. But I want to just give you the topics that photonics is hot today for you to, uh, if you want to read more about it. This was just an example of uh, uh, what what we are doing uh, yeah, in the lab. That. Uh, that kind of uh, bridges between fundamental questions in, uh, uh, in photonics and actual applications. Uh, but there are now many, many research areas that uh, rely on, uh, uh, on silicon photonics. When I mention silicon photonics, I really talk about silicon nitride, anything that you are using silicon uh, process. Uh, and I, uh, uh, I, I see here several friends that are uh, 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 all doing uh, this, uh, this kind uh, of work. Uh, my work with Paolo leverages uh, uh, silicon photonics for quantum optics. Uh, this beautiful uh, work done in uh, Unicampi for nonlinear and uh, for optomechanics. Uh, and in McKenzie for, for different uh, materials on uh, uh, photonics. Uh, so I'm gonna, unfortunately, I'm gonna skip that because uh, I can see that it is uh, 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 too much. And uh, there is a new, I just wanted to, uh, to touch base on that uh, because you might have heard that in, in, uh, in, uh, in conferences. There is a field that is definitely getting very, very hot and very interesting is the ability to use silicon photonics, use all those uh, 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 tools that we have to uh, manipulate light and control the uh, light transport in very unusual ways. So it turns out that, for example, you can break reciprocity. I told you when I described to you the coupler, I said everything is reciprocal with light. Well, maybe you can break that reciprocity. Uh, and that by, that's by doing, uh, uh, by using the dynam dynamically uh, changing, meaning changing faster than what light actually, when light actually propagates. Uh, um, and definitely one of the hardest topics uh, now is how do we leverage all this uh, platform for quantum optics? There is a lot of beautiful work 
done that uh, done in this regime and for non-linear uh, non optics. Um, um, so I'm mentioning uh, some of those and, and since the talk will be, uh, I think recorded, you can, you can extract uh, those publications and, and read. Okay, I'm gonna, uh, I see that I'm, uh, a uh, uh, very little uh, left, so I can uh, just touch base. This is relevant to a lot of the work that uh, the McKinsey folks are doing that I see that uh, they are uh, 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 attending. Uh, there is a, a very interesting research area now on integrating 2D materials on silicon photonics. And you should think about it, it's kind of a waveguide that averages it's in between the mode, the optical mode, is shared between the 2D material and the waveguide. And we've, uh, uh, we've shown uh, just a, uh, a couple of months ago that this can act as the best modulator you can get. It's very, I told you that light can only be modulated by very little, 0.1%. This changes by, uh, 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 can, can change much, uh, much more. And more importantly, it can change with almost no optical loss. So almost all modulators, they do induce some loss. This one doesn't, and it's compatible with silicon photonics. So we are very excited about that. And I'm gonna just uh, uh, leave you here with a, a picture of the people who actually uh, did the work. Like I said, I have many, uh, fantastic uh, students. Some of them are in the audience that are uh, uh, Brazilians. And unfortunately, I didn't get to talk about their work, but as years go by, it gets less and less. Uh, uh, um, I, ca I can't count it for me. They, they, are, they are doing their own work, but we are, are still watching from afar, and uh, it seems fantastic. So that's it. Thank you very much, Michal. I guess you can open the mics and <laughs> clap. <laughs> well, thank you very much for a wonderful talk. So many applications, so many ideas. Um, and I would like to open for questions now. Uh, vocês podem perguntar em português também, que como ela, ela falou no começo, ela entende perfeitamente, fala perfeitamente também. Então, vocês podem também levantar a mão pelo Zoom, tá bom? E a primeira pergunta é, ninguém menos que a Belita Coiler, que está com a mão levantada. Belita, pode acionar o seu microfone e fazer a sua pergunta? Hi, Michael, Olá. I want to how to pronounce your name. Very beautiful talk, I'm very happy that Silicon is making through optics too, not only through electronics. But I have a specific question on something you mentioned that for some effect that I don't remember, you need an array of atoms inside. So yeah, could... yeah, yeah, yeah. I wanted to motivate because I know that uh, that several of you guys are uh, interested in completely different application. Um, we are working with a uh, fantastic uh, theorist, uh, Anna Asenho, who uh, Paolo has uh, met, uh, on the analogy of all the phenomena that I, that I just described to you, right? I said, okay, if they're in phase, they form a beautiful beam, uh, and you can control that beam if you change that phase, uh, the relative phase. This is a sign of coherence of those dipoles, right? I am forcing, in photonics, right? I'm, I am exciting them all at once and they are coherent, right? Now, if I, I can use that as a signature to tell if my, let's say I have an array of atoms are coherent or not. So if I excite my, uh, my atoms, if they are in phase, and they're all in the same phase, I should get a beautiful beam formed. And the, the shape of my, what we call super radiance, or the shape of light that comes out of that array of atoms is, uh, 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 I can 
from that shape, I can uh, tell what is the degree of coherence or what is the relative phase uh, and if there is coherence uh, so, between uh, them. One more question. I mean, just to clarify, what kind of atoms you have in mind? And the atoms are inside the silicon or? No, 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 no. This is a completely no, no. Here we are talking about nothing to do with silicon photonics. Nothing to do. I just yeah. said that uh, I only mentioned that because uh, uh, just to, for those that are not working in this area, I am using the fact that the waveguides are dipoles. Okay. And I just said this is any, the beauty of, of here, it's such basic physics that it can be any dipole. It can be an atom. Oh, okay. okay. It's, there's nothing special. It doesn't matter what atom it is and it doesn't matter. I mean, it, it matters what atom it is because you want very strong, uh, uh, you want just radi radiance, uh, but that's it. Uh, I just said that for you to get a physical feeling. I will rest I got. Thank you very much. Thank you. Congratulations. Well, everything Paulo said is true. So now we have a question from Guilherme. Guilherme, you, you have an open mic. You can go ahead with your question. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Michal, for the excellent uh, talk. Uh, I have a question about the, the multimode device, uh, which is if, if we were talking about a cavity, there is this number, the finesse of the cavity that counts the number of round trips that you achieve, right? And uh, I'm wondering, what is the equivalent number for this wow. multi-passing uh, device and how does it translate in terms of efficiency? Like okay. when you apply yeah. the, the right. shift? Okay. Yeah. So okay. look, we make a lot of cavities. Uh, I, I didn't show uh, much here, but uh, uh, because we know how to make very, very low loss, we make objectively speaking, but here it's really objective. We make the best cavities. We have uh, quality factors of uh, 80 million. Uh, and the finesse can be... Now, so it, it is definitely possible to do, especially with silicon nitride, relatively high finesse. Uh, I'm not sure it's a good uh, analogy to ask uh, what is the finesse of this uh, bouncing because it's, it's, a, it's a broadband. So it's not a, uh, but you can ask what is, by how much you are improving. Uh, you're going through all this and, and it's at a minimal is by the number of modes. Usually you gain a little bit more because the uh, group velocity is a little bit higher uh, of some of them. Uh, so usually you get a factor of three kind of for free, <laughs> uh, but, uh, but it's by the number of modes. Thank you, thank you again. But, but, I show, but keep in mind that it's an example, what I showed is, is an example on what, where would you use the, uh, your ability to control those orthogonal modes. Uh, but we are now using this for many, many uh, uh, different applications. If you wanna really uh, think wild, uh, there is a whole field now uh, that is called a, a synthetic uh, uh, dimensions, meaning all of the physics that we know that goes in, that is in actual physical dimension, uh, you can, a, a reinterpret it in any orthogonal space, let's say uh, frequency or, uh, or modes. Uh, and that kind of, it's it, it, it very, very interesting. You can, you can uh, uh, use those modes to break reciprocity and so on. So it's a whole, it's a whole different uh, area. Okay, okay, nice. Thanks again. Okay, thank you. Now it's the uh, turn of uh, the question from Raza Sied. Raza, can you un go ahead with the question? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for a very informative talk. Uh, I'm from Brazilian Center for Research in Physics, Rio de Janeiro. Yeah. I work with ferromagnetic materials where we use coplanar waveguides by using radio frequency signals. 
my question is where uh, you was talking about controlling that specific modes uh, by using i select one mode which is a specific mode by using a uh, coplanar wave guide what you would like to comment about uh, my system when we are controlling with radio frequency signals and i have a coplanar wave guides i i, I can fabricate coplanar wave guides where i have a control uh, how how i can do this uh, in specific uh, to controlling these specific modes so yeah uh, a, so i have several things to, to say about okay. so so for the uh, naively when i look at your system it's a different way of changing the optical properties uh, i change it using heat or using uh, a carrier uh, you use it using the ferromagnetic effect Yes. Uh, so almost everything I said, for example, on effective modulation, hey, just do what I said and you will, you will get a very efficient modulator. That's it. Uh, uh, now, you also asked about how to use your ferromagnetic effect, or in other words, how to use the change in index in time, right, the modulation in time, Yes. To change the mode, right? That would be. It's an interesting question because what we are doing, what everything I showed you, we are changing the mode as light propagates, right? By shaping the waveguide. But of course, as light propagates, is it, you could do the same, the physics is the same, if you ch yes. stay in space and change the index in time. Uh, instead of actually physically changing the waveband. So if I would, if you're interested in doing that, that would mean looking at the shapes of, let's say my waveguide, but you can do it yourself, like kind of the shape that the waveband needs to, needs to do in order to change the mode. Look at what is the index as a function of time, right? As light propagates and you, and you can, you don't need to do that, stay in space. Stay, stay the same way, but don't change it, but then change it in time uh, with your modulator. So this is called modulation induced photonic transitions. We've done quite a lot of work on that and, it's, and that is basically the physics of that. You are kind of emulating the propagation by modulating in time. Yes, it's pretty interesting that we have a control to that right. specific uh, thing, whatever you want. It's really yeah, interesting. Exactly, very interesting, yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Raza. Now it's uh, Ivoni, Ivoni Abukerki. Please go ahead, Ivoni. Uh, hello, so thank you very much for the very nice talk. It's impressive work. Um, I am not from the area, so I'm gonna ask a very, very basic question. Oh, good. So, it's related to your first um, challenge, challenge number one in your slide, where the idea was how to get in or out of the wave, the light in or out of the waveguides. And what surprised me is that you said that when you solve this problem with this tip, that it does not depend on the wavelength. So maybe this is very intuitive for for who is from the area, but for me, it sounds like that it should depend on the wavelength. Is Okay, so uh, that's a very good, very good question. It's definitely not a naive question. It's a very good question. Uh, so first of all, what you already interpret what I said, which is exactly right. I said it has no cutoff, meaning it should not depend on the, uh, uh, of how small my waveguide is, but you are completely right. Uh, in photonics, uh, uh, or in waves in general, uh, it doesn't matter what I change, it's all the shape relative to the wavelengths. I can fix the shape and just change my wavelengths. Uh, Okay, so let me tell you the physics of what happens. So if you take a waveguide, a fixed dimension, okay? If I uh, increase my wavelengths relative to that 
that I mentioned is equivalent to me taking the waveguide for a fixed wavelength and making it small, right? And you are saying it's counterintuitive. Why is it, uh, how come I, I will always propagate for any wavelengths, right? That's your question. Yes, exactly. Uh, okay, so what physics tells us that I will always propagate, meaning I will always have evanescent field and I will be, it's kind of think about uh, holding light at a tip where all my, everything is evanescent. Is evanescent. So I'm holding a huge beam with oh, tiny with bit little needle, right? Okay. This is true, but only in reality, uh, it's hard to implement when the wavelength goes very, very big relative to the size. Why? Because it is only true if the, uh, the index of refraction uh, is completely homogeneous, meaning it is the same everywhere around the waveguide. If, if you have, and for, so for example, we use glass, right? Glass, it's silicon dioxide, right? It's very hard to get it exactly right, the actual index. It varies a lot. And that sensitivity of exactly getting the right, completely homogeneous increases, obviously, increases as you have more and more evanescent field because you need to make sure that all your, uh, so you need to be just right, uh, meaning the larger your mode, uh, the more precision you need mm -hmm. in making sure that the index is right. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Ivoni. Uh, now we have lots of people that uh, rested for questions without raising their hands. So I'm sorry for, for some of you that have raised your hands. I, I had people that uh, asked, for, asked, uh, asked for questions before. So next is actually Cristiano Di Matos. Cristiano, can you open your mic and, make a, and, and uh, say a question? I, I, can, I, can I have a little bit of a, of a parenthesis? Yes. Uh, I see here Roberto Panepucci and I need yeah. to tell a story about him. So, uh, Roberto, I'm going to... It's on my list to ask a question in three minutes, but go ahead, go ahead. Oh, really? So I'm going to I'm gonna, do it. I'm going to embarrass you. So I remember very clearly an email that he and Wilson sent. Uh, he was basically responsible for getting the fabrication working at Cornell for visible, uh, for, for, for light in silicon. And he, I remember the email he sent... Uh, I think you guys sent together or something like that. We're both, I remember corresponding both of you in the middle of the night saying, I see the light. So, <laughs> and this was after a year, you know, a trying and working so hard. Uh, and he did, uh, uh, he came as an expert in fabrication, basically uh, made it work. Mm -hmm. So he, he's uh, just a couple of people and then he, he asks his questions. Okay, Roberto. Okay. Now next wow. is... Cristiano Di Matt. Cristiano, can you can you open your mic and, and, and uh, say a question? Hi, Michal. Uh, thank hey. you very much for a very inspiring uh, talk as usual. It's very nice to see you and actually not only you, but several people, friends that I don't see for a while. Yeah. So hey, Julia. Yeah. Uh, yeah. My question is the following, Michal. I, I was very impressed with the with the this beam steering uh, device for, for the lighters, and I was thinking that uh, this is, in a way, it is very similar to a spatial light modulator, especially if you think backwards. If, if light is coming from the other side, then you're modulating it spatially. And then if you couple that, if you have that, before that, if you have a um, uh, diffraction grating, you can probably uh, play with the shape of, uh, so you just uh, disperse spatially uh, 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 an optical pulse, and then yes. you can play with the phase. Uh, have you? Yes, absolutely, about? absolutely, uh, absolutely. And, and uh, uh, it, it is really a spatial light modulator. Uh, it does very similar functionality, exactly like what you're saying. So why would you want silicon photonics as opposed to spatial light modulator? Because the spatial light modulators they are, uh, uh, the actual size of them is about 20 microns, the minimal feature. 
Uh, and that has to do with the polymer, they use liquid crystals or whatever they're using to, so the size is, uh, it's given by that. So uh, that means that they definitely don't uh, act as dipole, right? They're big. Right. Like when light exits that 20 microns is really going straight, it's not. So that means that my ability to actual steer is very small uh, because it doesn't really talk too much to the next door neighbor. Uh, so that, that, that kind of what, uh, so it's kind of fundamental. Uh, mm. what, but you know, combining them like what you said and using and definitely emulating some of the functionalities are very, is, a, is a very interesting direction, yeah. Yeah, you can probably do very interesting things in a very compact way with pulses. That's what I mean. Very exactly, nice. exactly. Using, yeah, absolutely. And engineering it to be dispersion dependence. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Cristiano. Now, next is actually Roberto, Roberto Panepucci. Go ahead, Roberto. Oi, Mihal, quanto tempo? Quanto tempo? <risos> Mihal, a pergunta é um pouco off topic, eu adorei a apresentação. E, é, bom, a gente tem aqui no Brasil uma diversidade de laboratórios que estão fabricando estruturas, né? Uhum. Yeah. Você se lembra que em Cornell a gente tinha um laboratório muito bom, né? Yeah. Um, tem uma fábrica no Brasil, a Teitec SA, no Rio Grande do Sul, que tem uma sala limpa e um, uma, é uma foundry né? muito bacana. E nós estamos trabalhando com eles para produzir é, low contrast, né? uh, uh, large dimension silicon photonics. E é, me parece que a gente vai perder essa fábrica, infelizmente. E nós não temos né, esse tipo de, de laboratório no Brasil. É um laboratório que custa pouco para manter por ano comparado com os dispêndios em P&D. Eu não sei, você... Você acha que é viável tentar trabalhar de forma séria fazendo fotônica em silício sem ter uma fábrica assim para você prototipar? Ou, ou, ou esse é mais um erro estratégico que nós vamos fazer aqui? Look, I think... Uh, if you don't have a foundry... Uh, uh, you're not a player. That's a real, that's the truth. Uh, now to make you feel a little better, you personally, uh, like you uh, as, a, as a researcher, all of you, uh, I don't use foundry. Uh, maybe I use a little bit, but the majority I don't uh, because I'm, I'm always kind of interested in the physics phenomena, but, but everything that I demonstrate goes straight to other groups like Karen Bergman and many others that immediately put it in foundries. And if you don't, then it becomes a curiosity. Uh, like for example, the LIDAR is in, the LIDAR, that specific, uh, LIDAR that I demonstrated, the first one was done almost by hand, right, by in, in a, at a university, but now it's in foundries. And if you didn't have a foundry, it would become irrelevant. So anything I can help you guys on justifying this uh, in meeting with whoever make a decision maker, I would absolutely... Uh, Great, I'll call you up on it. Absolutely. Thank you. Well, thank you. Next is Marcelo. Marcelo, uh, go ahead with your question. Marcelo Martinelli. Hey, Michal, thank you very much for the talk. It was really nice, uh, really good to see you know, on those days. Uh, so, yeah. and it comes to my mind a uh, question. I uh, have shown how to put light into, in, into your ship and extract it. Uh, I have shown how to put electric signal in, into the light. But uh, how about taking out, converting that light into, from the ship yeah. into an electrical output? Yeah, so I didn't talk, that's a very good question. Uh, and I, I should have mentioned that. I didn't talk about that because I, I'm always interested in the hard problems. Uh, and this was, this happened to be 
a relatively easy problem. Nothing is trivial, but it was a relatively easy problem. Uh, maybe I'm, I'm trivializing it a little too much, but, but, uh, but it's, there are germanium detectors uh, that you can integrate with silicon and, uh, and they act as wonderful detectors uh, for near IR. Uh, and for visible, you work with silicon nitride that is transparent for, uh, for visible. And then you detect using silicon, which also is perfect uh, detector. So detection was never, uh, was never, never a big challenge, was never a major challenge. Uh, in other, it not, but that's not true in all wavelengths. For example, in mid IR, is still a big challenge. Uh, so there are some spectral ranges where this is still a major, major problem. So the footprint would, uh, would be small. It's uh, small, sort of. it's small, yeah. it's super efficient. They, yeah, super, it's, it's, yeah. We've shown some of those detectors in uh, around 2007, but, but it, it was more of a demonstration of integration with silicon because the detectors themselves, they worked. Mm -hmm. we, we had that one, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, obrigado, Marcelo. É, nós temos mais, eu vou, temos mais duas perguntas e depois eu vou fechar para a gente não é, abusar demais. Uhum. Abusamos muito da Mihal, tá bom? Então, agora tem o Gustavo Widerhecker e depois o Paulo no Sensweig, daí a gente vai encerrar, tá bom? Gustavo, pode fazer a sua pergunta. Okay, so I have many stories about Gustavo, but I'm not going to do that. That's not fair. Uh, but uh, uh, Gustavo started a whole, he came with absolutely, with a completely different, completely different background, came and started. I remember I had one meeting with him. I said, why don't you look into this optomechanics? Looks interesting. And after a year, he kind of uh, started a whole area. Uh, so, yeah. Okay, so it was a great talk as usual, Michal. Uh, it's great to see you again on Clio. I think they missed this on Clio, right? They should have this open part on Clio because I remember chatting with you indirectly through the questions on Clio. So I think as conferences, they should have a real you video. You know that after we chatted. It's, it's after, so much better. We can see people, get absolutely. to know each other. It's, after we chatted, I, I, I sent an email to the organization saying, hey, we need to be able to chat. Yeah, I think yeah. that's that's that's, that's yeah. a good. It's a great thing. I, I didn't know Zoom was so good at it. It's just just proved to me right now. Yeah. So I, I have a question concerning much more of a perspective question, um, and I'd like to hear your thought on this. And, and just as a as a background, so the, this whole silicon photonics field, right? It started with with yourself, including, uh, and it was basically bare silicon insulator, right? Back then, oh, two thousand yeah. pre two thousand. And even though the thickness of the bird oxide layer, right, the oxide between the wafer and the silicon device layer was always way too thick for the standard CMOS, it was still silicon, right? Silicon was later and the, the whole field kept moving with this thing. But, uh, and then when I joined your group, I guess, there wasn't too much work on silicon nitride. And I think many of the works done at that time by Jake Levy, art, right, and, and other people really pushed the whole field towards nitride, right? right. A lot of people started using it, uh, being influenced by you, I guess. And I think it's fair to, to say that we're, oh, okay, silicon nitride is still CMOS compatible, but we started moving away a bit from the hardcore CMOS compatible stuff. And Later on, we start to see other materials playing a role, right? Like aluminum nitride. Now there's lithium niobate. There's right. uh, the stuff with the 2D materials, which is also great stuff coming out. We just showed one example. And my question is, you know, after this, this preamble, I mean, what is your vision? And uh, if we really want to enable this technology with, with these different materials, which might have great properties and, and provide us great devices and functionalities, if we want to get this at low cost, you know, really production accessible to different research groups, not like a niche, super expensive foundries like, like we have now, uh, we'll, what, what, what is the direction this is going? For example, are we somehow enabling these cheaper foundries, like the one that's been built in New York, uh, near uh, what is the city yeah. again? Albany, right? Yeah. Uh, is this driving towards a cheaper, 
photonics foundries that will eventually enable um, people to use photonics foundries uh, at low cost, yeah. or in yeah. the end of the day, we'll surrender to silicon, you know, right. and go right. back and say, hey, let's, okay, these were all, as you said, curiosities, great to, to demonstrate proof of principles, but in the end of the day, this is really expensive, will be niche research. And we, if you want to do something in mass production, low cost, and uh, really impact the society, we will need to drive back to, to silicon. What, what's your vision on this? It... I, I like a lot your question. Um, because, and it really captured the, the shift in, uh, in the community. And uh, the shift, the, what you are describing, that shift is not accidental. Uh, it, it makes sense. The beginning, the, the beginning of the field really was motivated by the, the, by the data communication, by the computing. So when you are just working with computing, uh, it makes sense for you to really commit and just do, uh, uh, just work with silicon, because that's, that's the one that you're gonna interface with. But in the beginning, and more than that, in the beginning of the field, the emphasis was so strong on computing uh, people were talking about um, putting the drive, and still there is a little bit of talk on that, uh, on integrating directly the drivers, like the electronics, the transistor, with the modulator. And at the time, the reason was, or the motivation was that the capacitance, if you actually, for example, let's say you have a let's say you have your electronics in one shape and you have your photonics in another shape, then in order to actually translate that information, right, to interface between them, you would have to kind of uh, uh, connect them and that capacitance would be too, too high. So you really want them sitting next to another. Today, you see almost no work on that. And almost no, I don't think anyone would actually say for real that this is reality. And it's because the electronics never got faster than gigahertz. I think we, I think we have a Gustavo. The bottom line, I think silicon nitride is here to stay in, with Albany. It's also, uh, uh, definitely they are integrating silicon nitride. Silicon nitride is absolutely real. Uh, the other ones are too early to say. So I don't know. I mean, the lithium niobate, you would need, lithium niobate is expensive. So you would need a very strong motivation. Now, it could be two options that I see. Either you have applications that rely on lithium niobate and then you make just a, just a foundry on that, or you develop a process, which is ideal. You develop a process to integrate the lithium niobate post-process meaning that you do, like you have in packaging, mm -hmm. where uh, it, it is something that doesn't really need to be etched in process. It is something that uh, fundamentally you can, you can integrate in a uh, post fab, in a much lower specialized fab. Okay, okay, thank you. Great to see you. Great to see you. Um, Okay, then maybe I won't ask a question, Michal. I was going to ask a little bit about the atoms uh, or maybe make a comment that I think with the equivalent with atoms, um, since you can change the state of atoms, you can actually have a lot of con control on your dipoles, right? And so right. that seems very interesting. Yes, right? yes, um, yes. Maybe I would just like to add to my introduction at the very end that my friend can be called a photonics wizard, bender and tamer of light. <laughs> okay, it was a real pleasure, it was fantastic. Beautiful talk. Okay, well, thanks everybody, Michal, thanks a lot for, sorry for this small- No problem, uh, it happened so often. Yeah. At the end, uh, but it was a beautiful talk and we all uh, have appreciated a lot and uh, and I think we can stop at that. And thank you so much. And hoping to see you back here many times. Yes. And thanks everybody for tuning in. Ciao.
OK. 